And in our time together today, this is what I want to do. I want to show you Jesus' process for making disciples and changing the world. And I want to light a fire in your heart, a passion in your life, that you would be about the same ministry that Jesus was about. And the beautiful thing about discipleship is this. Any man or woman, any color, any creed, any race, any background, any maturity level, filled with the Spirit of God, wielding the Word of God, can impact the people of God for the glory of God, right? And so I want to show you it's a simple process. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, and when you get there, you can say word. We get excited about saying word at Long Hollow because we know it's the word that changes our lives. Amen? You know, we live in a day and age where the Bible has become a footnote in the sermon. We live in a day and age where the Bible is a launching pad to say whatever we want. Friends, the only power we have to stand behind the sacred desk is to preach the word of God by the power of God. And that's the only thing we have power to say. The authority comes in the word. And so uh, the word of the Lord, if you're at Mark chapter 1, verse 14, say word. Say it like you mean it. (laughs) Let's me know you're awake in the back. The word of the Lord. After John was arrested, Jesus went to Galilee preaching the good news of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As he was passing along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother. They were casting a net into the sea since they were fishermen. Follow me, Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. I will make you fish for men, your version says. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in their boat, mending their nets. Immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of the Lord. Let's pray as we begin. Father, we pray that you would be the teacher and we would be the students. God, we want to know what it means to be a disciple maker, one who both invites people to Christ and invests in those we invite. God, we pray that you would open our hearts, open our minds to hear your truth. I pray today, God, we'd leave this place not saying that was a great sermon or a great preacher or even great worship. We would leave this place today and say we have been in the presence of a great God. May you be glorified. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. I want to give you two overarching themes of this passage. Very simple outline for this Uh, text that is rich with theological truth. Here's the first one. I want you to see the participants that Jesus calls. I want you to see, write it down, the participants that Jesus calls. The first one is Peter. We know Peter is like many of us in here. He has a foot-shaped mouth. Anybody have that? (laughs) Peter's always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong situation. But Jesus will use Peter. And although Peter denies Jesus, he will restore him on the Sea of Galilee. And Peter will go on to preach that amazing sermon where 3,000 people are saved. In addition to Peter, we see Andrew. Now, Andrew is not as vocal as Peter. Why? Because he probably can't get in a word edgewise with him as his brother. (laughs) You wouldn't either. Uh, And so Andrew doesn't have much to say. But when Andrew speaks or whenever Andrew does something, it's intentional. We see that Andrew knows exactly who Jesus is and what Jesus can do. Why? Because he's constantly bringing people to Jesus. In addition to that, we meet James. James is the brother of John, the son of Zebedee. Uh, They are part of a lucrative fishing enterprise with their father, and they leave it all to follow Jesus. James will go on to be the first martyr of the church. And then we have John. John is the one whom Jesus loved the most, it says. And I don't think John's being prideful there. I think he's just stating everyone knows that Jesus, Jesus and I have a close relationship. John will go on to write more of the New Testament than any of the 12 apostles. And we know that. He has many epistles and his gospel. I want you to notice something about these men, these participants. All of them had one profession. Do you know what it was? The audience participation part, by the way. Let me try that again. They all had one profession. What was it? They were fishermen, right? Now, that's not by accident. Let me give you a couple insights about these men. Write it down. The first one is this. They were all blue-collar workers. You ever notice that? All the 12 were blue-collar workers. James, John, Peter, Andrew were fishermen. 
Simon the Zealot was a card-carrying political activist. Matthew was a government employee, right? Thomas was a lawyer. He was always questioning, probably not, but he, he was always questioning Jesus, right? Every turn uh, of events. He wanted to know why they were doing what they were doing. The second thing I want you to see about these men is that they possess no formal education. None of these men had been trained in any of the theological institutes of Jerusalem, which would have been odd for a rabbi to call these men. Turn with me to Acts chapter 4. I want to show you an insight about these men. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. When you get there, you can say word. When they observed, this is Peter and John before the religious leaders, and they're questioning them about speaking out about Jesus. Notice verse 13. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and recognized, watch this, that they had been with Jesus. Now, I, I've been to a seminary. I've had multiple degrees at seminary like you. I'm thankful for how God uses seminaries to equip our men and women who will go out in the future. But I want to show you something, those who are in seminary, pastors in the ministry. You can have all the training in the world and not have Jesus, and you really have nothing. But you can have Jesus like these men had, and you have no seminary training, and you have everything. You see what he's saying? They recognized that they had been with Jesus. Now, I don't know how they recognized that, but I want people to recognize that about me. That when I walk into a place, we say, we don't know much about Robbie, but we do know one thing. This brother <laughs> has been with Jesus. Do you want God to say that about you? You want people to say that about you? This brother, this sister has been with Jesus. The third thing I want you to see about these men is that they were young men. They were young men. Now, what I'm about to say, I have to give you a disclaimer. It may catch you off guard. In fact, it caught me off guard when I first started researching this. I was researching this for a book I was writing on the Jewishness of Jesus. And I found seven reasons why I believe the disciples could have been teenagers. The only one who would have not been a teenager, probably in his early 20s, would have been Peter. And I want to give you seven reasons why. Write them down. You'll refer to them later. The first one is this. The title Jesus uses to refer to these men is an indication they could be young. When Jesus refers to his disciples, he refers to them as mikros or technion. Mikros in the language of the New Testament or mikros in the language of the New Testament is translated in Matthew chapter 10 verse 42 as little ones. I don't know about you. There's not many people calling me a little one, just, to say, just for the record, right? And there's not many people calling 30-year-olds little ones. Uh, another way to, to describe his disciples, Jesus used, was little children. We know that from the Greek word technion. We find that in John chapter 13, verse 33. The second reason why I want to submit to you, I think they could have been teenagers, is the training they went through. According to the Mishnah, you can look it up, a vote five is the track. The Mishnah gives a, a process by which you should grow up in the Lord. For every Jewish boy and girl, particularly men, at the age of five, that boy would enter into school. At the age of 10, they would study the oral traditions. At the age of 15, they would actually work for the family. At the age of 18, they would get married. At the age of 30, they could become a rabbi and teach other people. This was the process in the Mishnah for every Jewish boy. It would have been highly unlikely for men in their late 30s to leave their profession to go back to school. There's no reason for us to believe that Jesus would have gone against the cultural norms of his day. It would have been highly unlikely these men would have gone back to school in their late 20s or early 30s. Number three, marital status. Marital status. The only person we know about in the New Testament, in the area of the disciples, that was married was who? It was Peter, right? And we know that because Jesus goes to Peter's mother-in-law's house and heals her. It is highly unlikely that Jesus Christ would have gone against the cultural norm of his day and chosen bachelors, which would have been frowned upon as older men to follow him. But we can assume the reason they weren't married is because they were under the age of 18. Number four, my personal favorite, the temple tax. Turn with me to Matthew 17, the temple tax. Matthew 17, 24. Now, according to Exodus 30, every, watch this. Every Jewish man was required to pay the temple tax if he was over 20 years old. 
Every man had to do it. There was not an option. This was a tax. The only people we find paying the tax, you will see in Matthew 17, verse 24. So when you're there, say word. They're questioning Jesus about tax paying. When they came to Capernaum, those who collected the double drachma tax, now that's the tax, approached Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the double drachma tax? Yes, he said. When he went into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. What do you think, Simon? Who do earthly kings collect tariffs or taxes from? From their sons or from strangers? From strangers, he said. Then the sons are free, Jesus told him. But so we won't offend them. Go to the sea, cast in a fish hook, and take the first fish that you catch. When you open its mouth, you'll find a coin. Take it and give it to them for me and the rest of the disciples. (laughs) Is that what it says? No, no, no. Jesus says, take it and give it to them for me and who? And you. Now, I don't know about you. I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. I've done a lot of fishing in the Gulf. I have yet to find exact change to pay the IRS in a fish's mouth. I don't know about you. It just doesn't happen. We'd love for it too, but it just doesn't happen. Jesus, showing the sovereignty of God over all of creation, sends Peter to catch this fish. And it has exact change for Jesus And Peter, why didn't the disciples have to pay the tax? I want to submit to you because they were underage. Number five, traveling. It would have been highly unlikely for those in their 30s with families to leave everything and travel. It would have been a little easier for teenagers, 15, 16, 17-year-old men to do that. Number six, longevity. Longevity. We know that the apostles uh, lived long lives, particularly those who made it through, particularly John. John lived until the late first century, through the late first century. Uh, We know that from the dating of the writing of his books, particularly Revelation, uh, which is dated late in the first century, which means he was a young man when Jesus called him in the beginning of the first century. Number seven, the one I laugh at, immaturity. (laughs) Immaturity. The disciples consistently, as we read the Bible, develop characteristics of young men, uh, immature men, men who cannot understand theological concepts, men who are unaware that a devil is among them, men who want to call down fire from heaven against other people, men who have to put up their mom to go ask the master for a head seat at the table in the kingdom. I don't know about you, but I'm not asking my mom to go talk to the master so that I can sit one on the right and one on the left hand like James and John did. Now, here's the point. Can I prove biblically that these men were teenagers? No, it's only speculation. It doesn't hinder the truth of the gospel. I think, in fact, it enhances the truth of the gospel if they are teenagers. Why? Because it gives us credence to invest in young men and women. Do you realize that Jesus Christ possibly took a bunch of teenagers and changed the course of human history? Now, the reason I bring this up is, I think for years, you and I have looked at the apostles as these men who have been holier than us, right? These men who are on another level than us. And I'm not taking anything away from these men. We should honor them and we should appreciate them. But I want us to not glamorize or idolize these men. Here's what I want you to get. These men and and women who follow Jesus were just like us. They were average, ordinary men who had been set apart for an extraordinary task by an empowered spirit. Jesus Christ empowered them to do the ministry of God. And I want you to see if he can do it with these men, he can do it with you. I wonder what God could do if you went all in and surrendered everything to him. If you gave him everything, what could he do? He could change the world. That's what he did with these these 12. The second thing I want you to see.